All right, how's everyone doing out there today? Welcome to my channel. This is a channel for educational purposes, and we look at uh, some great theories of everything and all-encompassing theories, magnum opuses, and uh, the esoteric and obscure, things that can uh, help your life, um, help you uh, change, adjust your paradigms, uh, your holistic uh, viewpoint. And uh, today is the 361st video that we've done on the reciprocal system of theory. And the reciprocal system of theory is uh, was authored by Dewey B. Larson back in the 20th century. In 1959, he put out his two fundamental postulates. And those are, uh, he used as a basis for uh, deriving his theoretical universe, from which he wrote a number of books, kind of uh, comparing his theoretical universe with the universe that the scientists had already observed and measured and um, hypothesized. And uh, it's all a very interesting study. Uh, Larson, Larson's theoretical universe stacks up very well. Uh, he made a lot of predictions that came true. And uh, he has been utterly ignored by uh, the scientific establishment. And uh, he died back in 1990. Pretty much unknown. Left behind a small amount, a small group of followers... Uh, he has a journal called Reciprocity and a, an organization, um, but, you know, they're not out there, um, you know, with any type of uh, numbers. But the uh, research has, um, has improved and um, people are making headway. So it's, uh, it's promising, but it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, the reciprocal system is not easy to grasp. Uh, it could be easier. Larson was a great writer, I thought, but he wasn't such a great teacher. Uh, his concepts and his uh, arguments are all there, but uh, sometimes they're not in the easiest place to retrieve them. And uh, you know how it goes these days. People have a uh, very short attention span, and uh, they're not able to uh, wrap their heads around uh, difficult, unfamiliar concepts uh, without trying pretty hard. And uh, so Larson uh, kind of falls prey to that. Anyway, the basic idea behind Larson's reciprocal system by it uh, lies in those two fundamental postulates, in particular the first postulate, which uh, can be paraphrased as the universe is composed entirely of one component, motion, existing in three dimensions with uh, indiscrete units and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. Okay, so... The universe is made out of motion, and uh, not uh, just uh, any kind of motion, but in particular, uh, what Larson calls a scalar motion. That's a motion with a magnitude, but no specific direction. Um, you might want to think of it as kind of like a non-local motion. And uh, that motion... Uh, now you would in, you can envision a scalar motion uh, using a balloon with dots on it. If you blow up the balloon, all of the dots are moving away from each other, uh, but in no specific direction. So you have uh, just kind of a motion of every location on that balloon moving away from every other location on that balloon. There is no uh, specific motion. It's just uh, everything is moving away from everything else. And you might say, 
what kind of emotion is that? <laughs> you know, but um, the fact that you can envision it on the surface of a balloon uh, shows you that it does exist, but it was also has been observed uh, through scientists' telescopes uh, in their conclusion that all of the distant galaxies are moving away from each other. And if we're not so, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess heliocentric or um, anthropocentric to think that our galaxy is uh, at the center of that uh, expansion, then we would also have to assume that our galaxy is also participating in that movement away from all of the other galaxies. So this is a bona fide emotion, uh, but the scientists have not given it any type of they acknowledge its existence, but they don't give it any type of significance. Uh, but Larson puts it at the center. So the universe is made out of motion, particularly a scalar motion. And that motion exists in, okay, that is, that is what Larson calls clock time and clock space. Clock time, the clock is always getting later and later and later and later, but in no specific direction. The uh, expanding balloon uh, shows that the space is getting farther and farther and farther apart, but in no specific direction. That's clock time and clock space. Then we have coordinate time and coordinate space. Coordinate space, X, Y, Z coordinates, uh, three dimensions, volume, and we're accustomed to that concept in space. But as reciprocal aspects, space and time, um, both have the same qualities, just like any reciprocals. If you have uh, the reciprocals four over one and one over four, they have the same qualities, one and four, but they are just in uh, inverse order. And they multiply out to equal one. And so uh, if you have three dimensions of space, you can also posit that there would be three dimensions of time. Larson refers to that as coordinate time. So, um, and then you have discrete units. Space and time and motion come only in discrete units. You have to have a full unit of any of those things in order to have those things. You cannot have half a unit or, you know, a fraction of a unit. Um, you have to have a full unit. And uh, those units are very small, um, but... The unit of space is about one five hundred thousandth of an inch. The unit of time is one six quadrillionth of a second, um, even less than that. Uh, but uh, they do exist. And so when you're seeing a continuous motion, you're actually seeing a million, a bazillion frames of still motion just like if you were looking at a cartoon you recognize that this is not a continuous motion there's a bunch of still pictures that i'm looking at going by me very very fast and that is uh, the nature of this reciprocal system universe quantized discrete units if you have exactly one unit of space in one unit of time, keeping in mind that space over time is speed. The car is moving at 15 miles per hour, 15 miles of space in one hour of time. And um, basically all of our scientific quantities 
are relationships between space and time or time and space. And they can be expressed uh, exclusively um, through space and time units. You don't need mass units. Mass is in your Larson's uh, system is, is t to the third power over s to the third power. Space, space over time. I mean, speed is space over time. Energy is time over space. Acceleration is space over time to the second power. Force is time over space to the second power. Pressure is time over space to the fourth power. Uh, you know, it goes on like that. Uh, every different one of our scientific quantities is a uh, fraction of space and time. Uh, either uh, you know, space over time or time over space in one or more powers. And, um, but if you have one unit of space in one unit of time, you have the speed of light, which is what Larson refers to as unit speed. One over one equals one. And again, as I was saying about one, one is what you get when you multiply two reciprocals. So it's basically the center of the system. Now, the legacy scientists, the center of their system, the zero point, the, the midpoint, the neutral point is zero. And they measure plus, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four, plus five, and minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. The reciprocal system is a multiplicative system using reciprocals. And so if you have a multiplicative system using re reciprocals, your midpoint is one. And on one side, on the positive side, you have two, three, four, and five. But on the negative side, you have one half, one third, one fourth, and one fifth. Um, it's not a plus minus, it's a multiplicative system. When you multiply those numbers uh, with their uh, balance on the other side, you get one. And so this one over one equals one unit speed, the speed of light, is the zero point of the universe of motion, or it is the null point, the neutral point, the, uh, Larson calls it the reference point, or the progression of the natural reference system, um, the ether, the origin, these are all uh, the things that uh, pertain to the speed of light outward in all directions. And so there is an entire half of the universe that is moving faster than the speed of light. And um, then there is that, that Larson calls the cosmic sector. And there is half the universe moving slower than the speed of light that Larson calls the material sector. Einstein and his crowd only knew about the material sector, uh, evidenced by Einstein's dictum that the speed of light is the speed limit of the universe. Nothing moves faster than the speed of light. Well, um, that leaves out half of Larson's universe. Fortunately, that half of the universe can be kind of filled in real quick because um, of the reciprocal postulate. What's going on in the material universe is exactly the same on a general level as what's going on in the cosmic universe, except that you have to invert the roles of space and time. So once you cross that boundary, you have to invert the rules. So in the material sector, you have relations based on coordinate space, three dimensions of space, and clock time. Clock is always getting later and later and later. But in the cosmic sector, once you cross that speed of light boundary and move to faster than light speed, then you have coordinate time, three dimensions of time, and clock space. The space is always getting farther and farther and farther apart. Um, and you, um, so it kind of works that way. 
And then uh, Larson's second postulate is uh, less important and more disputed, but it is that the universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its primary magnitudes are absolute and its geometry is Euclidean. Now, one person who takes Larson to task on that second postulate is Dr. Bruce Perret, who uh, was, is one of the uh, chief revisers of the reciprocal system. Um, well, Dr. Peretz also passed away back in 2020, but uh, he came up with a system called RS2, the reciprocal system 2, or the reevaluation of the reciprocal system. Uh, today, we're going to go over some of his paper that is called the Lorentz factor. We started this paper yesterday, so you might want to go back a day if you want to go from the start. But uh, you may know that the Lorentz factor is what Einstein used. It's the mathematical um, uh, equation that you use in order to determine the, uh, how much uh, time slows down if you're starting to move at nearly the speed of light. And I believe it's basically like the square root of 1 minus... Uh, v squared over c squared, where v is the velocity or the speed, and uh, c is the speed of light. So you're basically determining the kind of the fraction of the speed of light and uh, using uh, the uh, square of that and then uh, taking the square root of that, 1 minus that. Uh, so uh, uh, in the first in the first day, the first uh, part of this paper, he was he basically had determined that this was can also be mapped out as the hypotenuse of a uh, right triangle, uh, also the um, the uh, radius of a circle. So in, in a unit circle with the velocity on the x-axis, the Lorentz factor. Uh, being the corresponding value on the y-axis. Okay, uh, the speed of light, unit speed, is the fulcrum between the motion in space and motion in time. As such, it is the upper limit of both those motions, essentially being the maximum speed of the universe, which is referred to as the progression of the natural reference system. You can only show you can only slow down from this speed. In space, you add time. So the speed of um, one space, one unit of space over one unit of time becomes one unit of space over n units of time. And that, so that equates to a speed less than the speed of light. And in time, you add space going from one over t, uh, one unit of time over one unit of space to one unit of time over n units of space, n being a, an integer, and remembering that when you cross the unit speed boundary, inversion takes place and speed becomes energy. So you're not moving into uh, so much um, less than one unit of space speed, you're moving into what less than one unit of energy if you're over in the cosmic sector. So it, it, it equates to greater than unit speed, but it's really energy. So it's less than one unit of energy. Energy and speed are reciprocals of one another. Energy, energy is time over space. Speed is space over time. Okay, um, this is indicated in the Lorentz factor because any value where V is greater than one becomes undefined. There is no solution to the equation because you would be moving at a velocity that is greater than the fastest velocity possible for the universe. The system is only solvable if uh, one, uh, if uh, V is between negative 1 and positive 1. Anything, photons, particles, atoms, molecules, etc., being carried 
by this progression, the progression of the natural reference system outward in all directions at the speed of light, will be moving at this maximum speed of the universe. Photons having no, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say maximum speed of the universe uh, because uh, if you go into the cosmic sector, you really are moving faster than the speed of light, but it's measured in energy. Um, and so speed, I don't think is the right word there, um, but I could be wrong. I have to think about that. Pho uh, photons having no net displacement in space or time in a vacuum have no resistance to this speed or this progression. That's, I think that's the word that I would use instead of speed is progression. But to this speed and will therefore be carried at this maximum speed, which is why we call it the speed of light or in the reciprocal system, unit speed, uh, and why the speed of light is constant in all reference frames in relativity. Uh, the speed of light is constant because photons are not moving. They are the only thing, are one of the only things that are motionless in this universe of motion. Therefore, they are carried by the progression. They're basically on the surface of that balloon, that expanding balloon. They're, they're moving outward at the speed of light in all directions because they are carried by the progression. That is the progression, the outward uh, movement at the speed of light in all directions. And other um, manifestations are uh, moving compared to that uh, expanding surface, but photons are not, and that's why they are measured as constants in all reference frames, because they are not moving at all, and the progression is constant in all reference frames. Photons are not actually moving on their own. They are just being carried by the progression. No relative motion to the speed of the progression. This is why light speed, the maximum speed of the universe, cannot be exceeded by any velocity in space. It has nothing to do with infinite mass or an object shrinking into non-existence, which is how the Lorentz factor is interpreted. The relations in the Lorentz factor understood as a unit circle do occur in the reciprocal system, but under different names. Larson unknowingly uses it as the ba basis of his initial motion. The problem is better understood in the complex plane, where the gamma function represents the imaginary um, the imaginary and axis um, one over uh, gamma equals negative gamma. By default, the universe is expanding at unit speed, having the coordinates of plus one um, comma zero on the diagram. Larson then introduces the concept of a direction reversal, which results in a linear vibration. This is moving inward uh, or left on the um, on the v axis. Uh, that could be gamma. Uh, I guess that is gamma. Moving left on the gamma axis to the coordinates zero comma plus or minus one. The progression velocity appears to stop at V equals zero, but there is now a split across the gamma axis. 
which is imaginary and rotational, creating the two oppositely directed rotations that are known as a birotation. The solution of this birotation can be expressed by Euler's formula using the exponential functions, uh, which is uh, e, uh, e to the i uh, the i gamma plus e to the negative i gamma squared. No, no, no. Uh, yes, squared equals cosine of gamma e plus i gamma plus e um, to the minus one gamma squared <laughs> equals cosine of gamma. So all that all that uh, totals out to be cosine of gamma. <laughs> And so the cosine is just um, the vertical axis, I think. So this direction reversal results in a cosine function, which Larson defines as a photon, the core of his rotating systems. Uh, this is uh, more or less Larson's... Um, or Peretz and his uh, his sidekick, uh, not really sidekick, but their co-researchers, Dr. KBK Nehru, uh, came up with this concept of the birotation, that the photon is a birotation. Um, Larson believed that the photon was uh, the combination of a translational motion and a vibrational motion in a 90 uh, orthogonal to the... Um, to the vibrational motion. When you combine the two, um, you know, you end up getting a sine wave, which is uh, the signature of the photon. Um, Perret here is saying that you get a cosine function, which is a sine wave. Um, also, if you uh, use a birotation, two counter rotating systems when they combine they also create a wave like that and uh, so that also could be the solution for a photon that's what uh, Nehru uh, um, posited with his birotation and so this birotation um, answers more questions than the um, Larson's version of the photon according to Perret. And um, this birotation kind of requires uh, us to admit that rotation is every bit as primary as translation or straight line movement. Um, and that vibration is just a byproduct of those two things. Um, rotation and translation. And um, this is really what Peret says is really putting the yin into a yin-yang uh, situation uh, where Larson is really using mostly yang energy where he's focused on a um, translational motion. And he says that the, uh, he says you you cannot rotate until you have something to rotate. And so he first posits the vibrational motion. And then, well, I guess it would be, he posits the vibrational motion. And this is the basic photon. And then once you have, uh, and well, that, and then that's plugged into this progression. And so once you have that, uh, photon, then you can rotate the photon, and that's where you get matter from. Matter comes out of uh, combinations of rotations of the photon. Uh, Perret says that rotation comes before that, and you uh, rotation is every bit as primary as translation in a universe of motion. 
Okay, we're going to leave it there. Um, hopefully tomorrow we will um, be able to wrap up this paper. Uh, there's just um, a couple more pages, I think. Uh, there's, there's more. Well, uh, there's some footnotes. We'll see. We might not be able to get through the footnotes. I think we should be able to get through the paper, though. And, um, you know, just hang in there with this. It's not easy stuff. Uh, but it's very rewarding if you uh, can kind of pierce, you can pierce uh, one veil at a time. And each time you do, it gets you coming back for more because there is something very right about this theory. And uh, it shows in the fact that Larson was able to make so many predictions and uh, to be able to calculate um, things strictly from his theory. Uh, we're going to be looking at his book called Basic Properties of Matter at some point soon, and that is his book on chemistry and the fact that he's able to actually um, use just his theoretical universe to uh, determine uh, so many basic properties of matter, such as the melting point and the compressibility, the boiling point and the um, specific heat and, you know, the uh, uh, valence and uh, so many different properties of matter um, were determined by Larson strictly from theory. So he's definitely, he definitely was onto something. I don't feel like he completed his work, but that's probably because he's just one guy and he's going up against an entire army of scientists and winning. So uh, that's why I uh, dedicate a lot of time to trying to learn the reciprocal system. I certainly am not, uh, I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. And hopefully I can at least help you, guide you to, uh, you know, the same kind of thrills that I've had about uh, being able to at least penetrate a little bit of this. Okay. Uh, thanks for tuning in today and have a nice day.